You see, people come into your home and they look around and if there's a bookshelf there, they're going to be taking little looks at it because they know that what you read goes into your head and it comes out all over your life. So they can tell a lot about you. So really the bookshelf is the heart of the home. And that's what we're going to make today. This bookshelf is in fact um, modeled after one that my dad brought over from England. So it has some classic English lines. For example, the shelves have beading on the front. That's done with a router, which I'll show you how to use. And there's also beading uh, on all the trim on the sides. It's got delicate sculptured lines. And then this little business across the top on the trim. Then they put a little Victorian motif carving here. The whole thing stands only four feet tall, so it's delicate. It's, it's good in any room. It's not some towering monstrosity. It's got character, though. Also, you'll notice that the boards that form the back also have a routered line in them, a, a beading. So that just adds a little bit of detail. The whole thing's made out of white pine, which is a really nice soft wood to work with. Only thing is that when you're working with white pine, it tends to um, cup if you're not if you're storing it for a while. And what cupping is, is that the, the wood smiles. It gets a kind of a, well, a cup shape to it, really. And so you need to clamp it if you're storing it. And even if you're working in a humid environment, it's good to clamp it overnight if you're leaving uh, the cut pieces like I did last night. So these three pieces are cut a little bit shorter than the sides, which are 48 inches tall, nice s compact size. This is cut a little bit shorter because that trim piece is inset. So I'll just lay them out here. First thing we're going to do is um, glue them together and then just set them aside for overnight till they, um, till they harden up. Okay, and it's just regular old carpenter's glue that you want to use. And it's, I don't know if you know much about carpenter's glue, but it's, uh, um, it's polyvinyl acetate. It's, it's sort of a polymer, a long chain polymer. There's cocktail conversation for you. And it cross links with itself. So you want to put the glue on both sides of the joint. So I'll get it all, you know what, let's go faster. Okay, we'll go all the way down this board and then all the way down the board next to it as well. And try not to leak it everywhere like I just did. There are so many wise words available to the modern Renaissance woman. For example, if you can't learn to do it well, learn to enjoy doing it badly. Uh, that's not very inspiring, though. But Walt Disney had the right idea. If you can dream it, you can do it. Unless your dream was about doing something naughty with your boss. Okay, the back is glued, it's clamped, it's setting up over there. I'm going to cut out the side pieces of the bookshelf now. That's this part over here. And I wasn't quite happy with the way this turned out. It's a little angular. So I've redrawn it over here on my fresh board in a more curvaceous way. And if you have trouble knowing exactly how curvy you want something, get a, a little French curve. This is a design tool and they're really helpful. They're pretty cheap too. Like you can get three of these in different sizes for about six bucks. And you can just kind of play with it till you get the look that you want. See what I'm saying? So that's fun to work with. And I'm going to cut this with a jigsaw, which is this little thing over here. This is the best little saw to have. If you, if they're not very expensive and they do all kinds of cuts. They're really versatile. Oops, glasses first. And um, I really like them. So go slowly when you're starting so that you don't rush the blade. And um, you want to make sure that if you do have any choppy spots on the mark that you just made, on the line that you cut, you want to sand them out because they'll transfer to the router, which I'm about to show you how to use. This one's pretty good. 
you know, you get better at it as you go. There's a little bump there though. And I want to get rid of that because when the when I start routing it, any little hiccup like that will transfer into that lovely beaded pattern. So you'll have a little bump in your bead. You never want to have a bump in your bead. So uh, I'll get rid of that right away. And uh, then we'll just move on to routing. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to set this board up to route it and, or router it, I'm not sure what the verb is really. And um, the routers that are available on the market are many and varied and um, if you like the look of this you might want to rent, woo, see ya. You might want to rent one for a day or two and uh, practice on a bunch of different kinds of wood till you get the feeling for it and then you'll know what features you like the best. That board is definitely cupped. Look, it's got a little ski jump thing happening. This is the router and um, it takes all kinds of different bits. Sometimes I just loop the uh, plug in my belt so I remember that I don't want to be working on the bit with it plugged in. This is the bit. This is a, happens to be a plunge router so it, it goes down like this. They don't all do that. The exhaust comes out here. It's great. Um, and they cut whatever shape of bit you put in them, they cut that into the edge of the wood. So it's really a fun tool. They all have a lock nut that you loosen or tighten to get change bits basically. And they all have some kind of um, gauge to, to subtly change how deep your bit is going. So I've set this bit not all the way because I want that wheel to be running along the very edge of the board. Right? That little wheel at the very bottom is going to be the guide wheel. So it'll tell me how, it basically just guides the, the depth of the cut. All right, so now I can plug this in. And then um, it throws quite a bit of dust, a router does. So you need to cover yourself up well. And when you're working on the outside of a board, you always work counterclockwise. So I'll start at that end and then we'll finish up on the curve. And the mistake that most beginner routers make is that they don't go fast enough, believe it or not. And so they end up with a rougher cut. So this is the trigger, the safety trigger. I have to have this pressed before I can start the motor. Okay, then release it so that it, you never set the thing down on the bit. So how'd that turn out? Okay, it's not so bad. It's a little bit rough in spots, so I'm going to need to sand all these edges down. Then I'm going to apply the same beading pattern to all the shelves and to the other side so that I've got the whole thing cut out and, and looking pretty, and then I'll put it together. The science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin said, the only thing that makes life possible is the permanent, intolerable uncertainty of not knowing what comes next. Well, that may be true of science fiction, but if you don't know what comes next in carpentry, it's no picnic. Okay. I have all the pieces cut out, I have all the pieces routed, and I've sanded everything so that it's all nice and smooth. And now I've got the back again, the one that I had glued earlier and clamped. And you can see here, I'll just dust this out a bit, I routed with a different bit a detail beading line just down the middle of the joint. And I've set up to do it the same thing again over here. And the thing is, you have to get a couple of boards and clamp them to the back 
to make a fence, it's called a fence, for the router to slide along, because there's absolutely no way you could freehand that line and get it straight unless you're some kind of a god. So you need to make sure that you've clamped everything down properly and uh, then let her rip. That's all there really is to that beading line. And um, it looks like I set it a little bit deeper on this side, but a little bit of variety never hurt anybody. So there we have that ready to go. We'll take this off, put it over here. And now I want to paint the wood a little bit. It's everything sanded so I can stain it. And I'm using aniline stain, which is a water-based stain. And it's, it just is the most fun to use. Check this out. This is actually antique honey. It goes on awfully brown. But it ends up this color, because what you do is you dilute it with water, like that, and then take off the excess with a rag so that it just has this lovely honey look at the end. Only trick with this stuff is, Watch what it does in the end grain. It really sucks it up in the end grain. So it's too dark, and it won't look pretty on those nice routed beaded edges. So look what happens if you just spray the end grain first with some water. Then it won't take up as much of the stain. And that's more the texture or the color depth that you want. Okay, so that's just a little trick when you're working with aniline stains. So I'll now stain everything and then I'll put it together. All right, the bookshelf is coming together now. Things are looking good. I'm going to stand the sides up. Remember the sides are four feet tall, well at the very tallest point. And then the back is actually cut to um, 46 and a half inches. See, look, it's a little bit short. And that's because of that trim bit, the piece I want to put in the top. And then this is a board that I just um, I put a different router bit on. It's a piece of one by three pine. And it sits like this on top of the bottom shelf to make a little skirt at the bottom so it looks a little bit fancier. The bottom shelf, of course, doesn't need to be uh, beaded along the edge because it's going to be hidden. Oh. OK, that's just going to happen a bit at first. OK. And you know, oh, it's going to be one of those times, isn't it? OK, I'm just going to take a slight moment right now. You, you make them sort of kiss in the middle. Ah, OK, wait. Oh, don't. OK, you go like this. Let's just get one shelf on here, and then I'll feel so much better. OK, so that's going to go like that. And then this one's going to, oh, OK, wait. <laughs> it's never easy. There's just no easy way, really, is there? No, there really isn't. OK, so. <clears throat> I need to lie down. <laughs> there have been days when I thought I was really making progress, only to be upended by some wayward piece of lumber. You know, Berlioz was right when he said, time is a great teacher but unfortunately, it kills all its pupils. Okay, now I can show you the kissing technique with the clamps. Okay, so one goes here, then the other one goes like, <laughs> like this. Oh. Okay, wait. Like this. 
Right, and then this one just hooks on like this. I call that the kissing thing. Okay, it's not quite long enough. Now it is. See, that's a good way to do it if you have clamps that aren't th quite the right size. Okay, so once I get all this thing all clamped up, then um, I, I can actually start squaring the shelves with this, which is a, a speed square. And you just go along the shelves like this, and you can tell if they're square or not. <laughs> like this. See, this is not square. I need to adjust that. But first, clamp everything. And it just needs to go up a bit at the back. Right like that. So, ooh! So I'll do the same thing to all the shells, and then I'll, um, I'll be ready to nail the whole thing together. And to, to do the nailing, I want to use um, an invisible nailer, which is kind of a neat device that I've discovered. And it's available at specialty wood supply shops. And you need a, a couple of special pieces of equipment. And one of them is this little English plane. It's got a tiny little blade on it. It's a really sweet little tool, kind of like a violin maker's plane. And what you do is just put it on the surface of the wood next to where you want to drive a nail in, which is this shelf here. And I'm just going to lift a shaving like this. Okay, I, I've set the blade just a little too deep and it's cutting too deep. But the idea is you peel that away, trying not to break it, then I'm going to put a nail in there. Okay, so in the nail goes. You stop about a quarter of an inch out, and this is a nail set. It's got a tiny little kind of pointy bit right at the end there, and it sits in the dimple on top of the finish nail. So then I just drive that in. And I want to set the nail slightly below, I don't know if you can see it, but I've set it underneath the level of the shaving bed. Um, that way, when I take my fish glue, which is a high-tack glue, it sets up fairly quickly, it stinks, but what the heck. Just, it's like a little nail polish applicator. You just lay the glue in the shaving bed, like that then fold the shaving back down over it and take a piece of either cellophane tape or this low, um, low adhesive masking tape and just put it over the shaving like that. And that holds it in place. Cool, eh? So there's a lot of that to go on because I need to put nails in all the shelves on both sides. I also need to nail the sides to the back that lovely three-board back that we've got going on there. So I'll get that all organized and then uh, go from there. Just pulling off the um, masking tape now, you wouldn't want to let the masking tape sit on the fish glue stuff for uh, longer than a day or so because it starts to get really tacky. Blue masking tape is supposed to be good for seven days without really getting sticky, but, you know, wood's tender. So I just want to show you really quickly how to do that little carving detail that I had. Um, this is a V tool. It's a carver's tool, and it's got a V shape in it, so it really goes quickly once you get going. So I'll just brace the shelf, and I'll, I'll make the... This is actually, oops, a Victorian design I found in a book. So there's the stock. And then the leaves are just, they just come out of the stalk like this. And they get a little smaller toward the top. Like that, see? There. And because we, um, you know, need to practice a little bit, but uh, because it was uh, dark, and then the carving brings out the light wood underneath, it looks really pretty. It's called a relief technique. Now. 
Bookshelves are important. See, like I wanted to copy the ones my dad brought from England. And um, there are lots of artisans making gorgeous bookshelves. This was made by Anesti O'Dowd. It's a tall model. And the nice thing about the tall models is that you can put trim, crown molding trim around the top, and it really finishes them beautifully. And then he's chamfered this corner to give it a little bit of extra personality, take the hard edges off. And that's done using a router. And um, he also put this centerpiece in, which is kind of cool, because then you can mount doors on this. So this could actually be used as a hutch, not just as a bookshelf. So you can sort of like, it's cool, because once you know how to build something simple, you start looking around at things and thinking, oh, oh, that's how they did that. So I, I kind of like being able to do that. It solves some of the mysteries in life. And then, you know, maybe you can write a book about that, because on your bookshelf, you should maybe have one book that you wrote. That would be good. Keeping a collection of quotations is kind of old-fashioned. I have all of my mum's handwritten quote books, and the words she copied into them tell you a lot. For example, the words of Albert Einstein. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is as though everything is a miracle.